Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to take great pleasure in welcoming you to this room and to the National Museum because apart from uh, working for DHR Communications, I chair the board of the National Museum of Ireland and I spend a lot of my time here. So I sort of feel it's my semi-home as well. Um, and if any of you actually get a chance uh, to, ro to kind of roam about the museum over lunch, you know, take 10 minutes or whatever, can I highly recommend a little exhibition that's uh, recently opened. It's on our glass heritage and it's a project that was developed with the um, former masters from Waterford Glass. And what they done was they took objects from our collection. So for example, the ancient St. Patrick's Bell and they reimagined it and created a glass version of the St. Patrick's Bell. It's a beautiful exhibition. It's just right across the courtyard there. And it takes about, well, you know, you could spend an hour or more <laughs> if you want it, but you can do a whistle stop tour. And it's just very lovely. And the story behind it and the story of the various men who worked to produce these um, modern pieces that reflect on our old and ancient heritage is uh, something that's very nice. And it's nice to have the time to reflect on it. So, um, welcome everyone, and uh, my session now, it was due to last um, about 40 minutes, so we're down to 35 minutes, and it's not really a talk, I think it's more a workshop, so I would like it if there's anything that I say you want clarification on, or you have an idea on, or you've done something that might reinforce what I've said, then just put up your hand and we'll keep this as informal as possible, even though it looks very formal. Uh, so just to kind of move very quickly along, I think, you know, we often think about media, oh, we need to get into the media to uh, publicise our event, and you kind of do, but there are also other ways and means of doing it, and sometimes, you know, media is just a part of that, and that's kind of one of my big messages today. So I'm going to start off just giving you an overview of you know, how Irish people consume media, what they like and what they don't like. So I have a chart here, uh, if this moves. Um. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to get the... Sorry, I haven't used this computer before, but the forward button doesn't work, so there may be another way of... Okay, sorry, I have it now. Okay, so this first slide is just really about the kinds of news and the kinds of information that Irish audiences like. So every year, Reuters, you've all heard of Reuters, it's a big international news agency, they do a report in most countries um, where news is well consumed and this really just goes through the kinds of news that we like to consume. So Irish people are most interested in local news and regional news. So everybody in this room is in a good place because you have a local message in terms of Heritage Week and your local engagement as well, as many of you will have a national message too. Um, and then kind of moving down, obviously international crime, justice, they're not exactly your areas. But health, environment, yes. They're sort of your areas, all right, because, you know, time out uh, enjoying your local heritage, whether it's your environment or taking 10 minutes to go over and reflect on our ancient heritage. It's all good for our health, whether it's our physical health or our mental health, but certainly good for our well-being. Science and technology, politics, maybe not. Lifestyle, certainly. You know, people like to plan, and um, Brian was just speaking about um, the last speaker just talking about summer holidays and finding times and things to do. People always consult kind of leisure mag magazines, what to do with the family over the summer or whatever. And that's all sort of lifestyle and leisure. And then arts and culture feature as well and entertainment. They're the last two. And there's lots of other areas that we're interested in, but they're the top ones that come out in this Reuters report every year. So we are speaking to a relatively interested audience to start out with. So that's kind of good news. Now, unfortunately, when you're communicating to the Irish population, to your local community, everybody is consuming their news and information in different ways. So most of us growing up as children, uh, we watched the six o'clock news and everybody watched the six o'clock news together and we talked about it and we all knew the same news. 
Now, somebody looks at their phone, absorbs their news that way, somebody else is reading a newspaper, and somebody else is looking at the six o'clock news or the nine o'clock news. We no longer consume information kind of in groups the same way as we did in the past. Uh, but on that, I suppose there's kind of certain trends. Less people are watching TV, but at the same time, television is very important in Irish life, and it still maintains a good presence, like 68% of people still watch news and kind of news-related programmes. So including in that is something like Nationwide, for example, and The Late Late Show, that kind of thing. So we're all still relatively interested. Uh, radio listenership it is declining as well, uh, but in saying that, we're quite different than our European counterparts. Radio has nosedived much further in the European kind of context. And as radio listeners, we tend to maybe tune into something like national radio, so Morning Ireland, when we wake up in the morning. But kind of by 9, 10 o'clock, we've switched over to our local radio. And that's where we sort of tend to keep the dial for most of the day. So local radio is really important in planning your um, publicity and messaging around Heritage Week. Uh, then you'll see, unfortunately, uh, the decline of the print media, and that's the one that's falling the most, and that includes your local newspaper. So, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was a great rise in the number of free sheets. People were getting free newspapers in their door and all kinds of things. We've seen a huge decline in that, and you might still have one or two principal newspapers in your uh, county or in your uh, geographical area, but that's seen a heavy decline. And unfortunately as well, I suppose, um, in the newspaper industry, there's also huge pressure on staffing and resources. So you'll find that there's been a reduction in the numbers of journalists working in local newspapers. That means you have to bring the news to them rather than expect them to come out and get the news. So use that to your advantage. Uh, then online presence, most people will get information online. We research things a lot. When you're going on a holiday, you research what restaurants to go to, what hotels to stay. People do that as well when it comes to planning your weekend or planning little bits and pieces to do with your local life as well. So that's become increasingly important. And then uh, social media continues to increase as well. The problem with social media is that there are lots of different types of social media. So we have Facebook, and yesterday you might have heard, like Facebook had still had an increase in their followings despite their uh, bad month, let's say, um, because they put a huge amount of money into market and try and attract more people to join Facebook. But we've seen big trends and changes in Facebook. So, uh, for example, um, anybody that's in this so-called Generation Z, so that's anybody under 20, they don't really like Facebook, they don't like oversharing, they like very private kind of communications. So they like Snapchat, they might like a bit of Instagram, they like private messenger. So when you start into social media, you have to really think about the audience that you're trying to communicate with. So Facebook users tend to be people that are over 30, into mid 40s, 50s. Uh, Twitter, for example, they're primarily people that are interested in news. Um, so you have to be active on lots of different platforms if you want to reach general audiences. But my suggestion to you is think about the audience you want to reach. So is it school children? You know, is it families? Then you need to speak to parents. Um, and mothers tend to be more organized than the fathers, so no offense to anybody, but actually that's what the research sort of tells us. And uh, women will access information about education, health, lifestyle, all those things through um, social media. And Facebook is actually quite important um, for that particular sort of demographic. So that's just to give you a sense of the landscape in which we receive communications, we receive our news. And to kind of further break that down then, um, these are just kind of lists of things that you might want to consider when you're planning how to promote your event for Heritage Week. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the media. You have your local newspapers, you have free sheets. You have your uh, local radio, I think, is... is really important um, and many of you will have access to community radio. While listenership isn't as strong, uh, that it's a good way of getting your message out there and growing a community of support. Uh, word of mouth is something we all crave and we all kind of follow. So I've mentioned, you know, when you're researching your holiday, um, I don't know how many people will 
log on to TripAdvisor, you know, uh, to find out what other people thought of the hotel that you're planning to stay in. Actually, we're kind of all like Brown's cows, you know, if it's not liked or whatever, then we're not going to go. Um, so what you need to do is start thinking about how you can collect good reviews of your um, centre or your project so that other people will um, talk about it and communicate it on your behalf because they're kind of warm recommendations. They're not something that you read and you make a judgment on. You're being encouraged because other people feel, um, feel positive about the experience that they've just had. So while I don't expect everybody to open a TripAdvisor account in the morning, but you might think of ways of actually capturing feedback and putting that back out there. You can use it on Facebook, you can use it even on some of your printed collateral material. Yeah, go for it. Sorry there. Sometimes I get really put off if somebody kind of goes, please like them or give them a recommendation on TripAdvisor, please leave a man, you know, you can almost get put off. So is, is there a better way of soliciting good recommendations? <laughs> <or> <laughs> You get a free cup of coffee if you. Um, <laughs> uh, I suppose I was kind of thinking about that um, on the way in. You know, now it very much depends because, like, there's a di diverse range of projects in this room today. You know, some of you are highly organised, your existing sort of attractions or whatever, and then some of you are doing kind of community activity for Heritage Week. So I would suggest the best way to get feedback is when people are actually sort of leaving, kind of, or after having a positive experience. Go ahead. Um, one other thing as well, TripAdvisor review express. So if people sign up with an email, you can even if you if they opt into your marketing, you can get you can upload that to TripAdvisor and TripAdvisor will email on your behalf. So that is generally known as a little bit better. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, but there, I think there's other ways and, and one of the ways, like I I love visiting museums and um I kind of was particularly touched by an experience I had about two years ago. Uh, we visited, um, I was in Washington and we visited this, um, the Holocaust Museum. I don't know if any, uh, it's near the Smithsonian and obviously all those experiences are sort of free and they're, you know, really high quality. But there was a particular um, exhibition and it was targeted at children. So somebody was talking about children this morning, you know, and at the time, you know, I had my little boy with me and you know we went through it or whatever and it was kind of the story was you know this little boy growing up and you know what happened to his family it was all very devastating and all very real because it was a true story and his mother and his sister were killed and you know then there were, you're imparting that on at the time I think it was a six-year-old a couple of years ago um, so at the end of it then there was a, just a little um, place where you could write on a post-it sort of like a debrief and you could kind of hang it up if you were happy to have that used in a kind of public way and you could put it in a box if you wanted to have it private you know and there's lots of kind of ways you can integrate that without sort of you know making it like please you know uh, give me a good review on TripAdvisor, you know, and you can use that in kind of softer ways um, and it's very nice and even those endorsements, I think, are good for the morale of your volunteers and of your staff, you know, they go a long way towards feeding more than just more customers, you know, they, they make you more enthusiastic, but also positive feedback and negative feedback or useful feedback helps you to improve what you're doing. So invite feedback in different ways, it doesn't have to just be TripAdvisor and I'm sort of getting back to been a bit more manual about things because I think we're all a little bit kind of overwhelmed by so much sort of social media and you know particularly I suppose over kind of the summer when you're looking at things you just become so frustrated as to like where do I go you know what do I believe so anyway that's kind of the word of mouth so particularly in a local community if somebody has said it say well tell your family and your friends make sure you phone somebody you know encourage people to do something that's actually possible and tangible without having to switch on your device you know and um, then not to shy away from this but the idea of putting an old poster up or a notice in the supermarket you know we've sort of abandoned the idea and the supermarkets still have their notice boards and they're largely empty these days, libraries, citizens' informations. Think of all the things that are in your community that you can do a quick poster for, um, get a child to design it, bring a bit of colour into it. You know, most people know where to find a colour photocopier, you know, A3 will do perfectly. So, you know, you don't have to be too sort of, you know, glossy or anything about it. Actually, something that stands out is something that's a little bit handmade and a little bit old-fashioned um, because you're competing against a lot of what's the same 
game um, in general. Then you can do a bit of marketing, anybody with a little bit of budget, obviously, you know, if you can have an ad on local radio, great. Local radio might do a little shout out or a sting in their community notices, so check with your local radio, can you put in a community notice? Most local radios don't charge for their community notices. Uh, an ad, you know, if you have 200 euro to spend, local radio is a good place to spend it and they'll very much appreciate it. Um, I mentioned posters, signs, you know, signs at the beginning, at the entrance to the town, uh, trails, you know, something to kind of highlight and promote. Obviously with signage you need uh, permission, so you might need permission from your local authority, you might need permission from the OPW or whatever, but just don't stick a sign up and then have to take it down the next day. And if you put up signs, take them down again. And there's a couple of kind of tips about using sustainable signage, so if you're going to commission signs, think about using them next year, so rather than having 2018 or whatever, just you know, call it something that you can use those signs uh, year after year. And uh, curry board is fully recyclable and everything else, so you can go off, use that, and reuse it again and again. Um, door drops, if you're from a town or if there's housing estates or whatever, that you can stick a flyer through people's door rocks, go ahead, try that. Uh, targeting workplaces, so you know, if your heritage event um, is uh, around Heritage Week, you know, during, before, after, whatever, you know, think about, uh, say, putting kind of leaflets or notices into staff canteens, maybe sometime in <coughs> July, because a lot of people will be taking their holidays in August. It's when most people with children in particular take the holidays, so promote it in workplaces. Uh, children will be going to summer camps. Uh, most summer camps happen in July. You know, communicate with your local whiz kids or um, what's the other thing, some dance thing or whatever you'll know in your own community and stick a letter in the bag when the kids get home about your heritage event. So everybody knows, you know, the notices you get from school with the school lice and that kind of thing. Well, you know, an odd kind of useful one <laughs> or more sort of um, enjoyable one or whatever can be um, maybe integrated if you speak with summer camp organisers. So think outside the box a little bit. You know, you don't always have to think of the linear kind of media approach. Um, and then social media, you can promote posts. So go ahead, yeah. Once again, you could email local band breakfast in your area and you could email them stuff. Say that again? Uh, 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 local band breakfast in the area, then bring it to us. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like what you're doing supports the tourism infrastructure. And, you know, the longer people stay, in your area, the better for everybody. You know, the shop benefits, the B and B benefits. So if you can sort of collaborate with them and help them to sort of support their economy, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. You get more people at your event, they get longer stays and, and whatever. Go for it. From my experience, I, I really have those bullet points in that order. I would put <coughs> your radio, local radio number one and probably the closest supermarket, the second, and public marketing, I would consider the, 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 the drawbox draw to fall. This isn't a, a list of priorities, this is just a scattergun list, and I think it's really up to people to choose what's best for themselves and their local community. So that's what you would do, but maybe somebody living, for example, that's doing an event in Drimna out in Dublin, you know, like there isn't really the same level of there isn't local media penetration and a door drop actually will be really effective in those circumstances so i think you cut your cloth to measure there isn't a one size fits all so there's no order to these so that's why there's no numbers it's just bullet points so <laughs> i didn't think that anybody would read these door drop literature or rubbish mm -hmm. well i think it's interesting. well again can i just suggest if you are putting stuff through people's doors um like one thing, for example, uh, I live in a housing estate and there's an annual garden party and it's done up like I'd say by an eight year old or something, the little notice and it's lovely and everybody goes to it. It's the, it's the leaflet that probably is most responded to in our streets. So, you know, I think you have to really think about who you want to get there and how to communicate with them. Yes, uh, in 2016 we did a survey of, you know, asking people how they had heard about the event and lots of people <coughs> took the box for the leaflet in the door mm -hmm. uh, because especially older people, they're not on maybe social media or whatever mm -hmm. uh, the local newspapers only buy monthly so uh, it didn't coincide uh, with the event and, and we found it very effective. Yeah. 
I think it's just a matter of choosing rather than saying, you know, one is right or the other. But I think it's for everybody, it's probably too much to do all of them. So pick what you think might be the most effective. And that goes back to my previous slide. You know, think about your audience. Who is it you want to get to this thing? And then think about what they um, use and what kind of media is available to you. So anyway, just, you know, my purpose here is really to talk about media. I have like 16 minutes left. Um, <laughs> but um, I just want to say that, you know, the media isn't the be end and I know everybody kind of thinks it is or you think it is. Um, and, you know, I work in public relations and people say, we want media coverage, you know. And you kind of say, yeah, we can get great media coverage, but it doesn't actually bring people to things. It's only part of a campaign. So that's just really important to think about that. And sometimes you're better off spending your energy doing some of the other things. So very, very quickly, <laughs> I'm going to have to sort of fly through, you know, the ingredients for a successful media. And lots of you have been working on Heritage Week for years and years, and you will have lots of brilliant tips and things to share. So I suggest, like, when you're on your quick lunch break, when you're going over to that exhibition, you can talk to other people about what they did and what works for them, um, because uh, I think there's lots of valuable information in this room. Um, you need a good story. So, like, you do an event every year. What's different about your event this year? Um, you know, what are the standout things? How do you make it more interesting or more exciting than your event last year? You need a bit of a good story. So, we always say, what's the angle? What's the news? What makes it a little bit different? And you sort of bring that out to the top in all of your communications, in all of your tweets, all of your press releases, Facebook posts, not just the same event, it's what's different about this event. And that's what interests people. How is your story relevant? You know, bored with summer holidays, last week before school, stimulate your children, get them learning again, get them interested. You know, think about kind of angling in on what's relevant and what people are thinking about at the time. Or then so, sort of think about maybe some newsworthy issues. So um, I just put in there, just as a reminder to myself more or less, but you know, the environment and single-use plastics are huge at the moment. You know, like children are learning about it in their green schools and it's a big message and retailers are all very conscious of it because next year, you know what, we're going to have legislation that has to decrease the amount of packaging from our supermarkets. So we're all sort of aware of that issue. And I'm suggesting, you know, if you have a heritage event, if you have woodland walks or whatever it is, you know, maybe you need a little bit of a, you know, don't kind of think people... Think about framing people that they're going to do this walk without plastic or something. Set a bit of a challenge. And that sort of um, allows them to kind of fit into an agenda. It also makes your story a little bit more newsworthy. Is there a potential for a good photo in what you're doing? And if there's brilliant potential, either before you launch your event, you might have to kind of make a photo out of it, you know, say, you know, getting ready to launch our Heritage Week event, you're painting the walls or you're weeding or you're doing something get a great photo of, you know, people in action on that. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to get a good photographer. And then do you have somebody that's good to kind of talk about your event that will attract people to listen? And I just have a, a word of great caution here. You know, some people think great talkers, they talk for Ireland, you know, but do they have something really interesting to say is the question, you know? So it's about bringing those kind of lively little stories um, into the frame. And, you know, people that are going to give good information, that are going to make people sit back and say, wow, this sounds amazing. So it's the sort of little facts and the things that of intrigue that are going to interest people. So sometimes it's not always the chair of your local heritage group or whatever. Sometimes it's the historian or the, as in the local historian, you know, um, or it's somebody else in the group that might be a better speaker. So just think about who's the best person to sell your event and sell your story rather than in the hierarchy, who's the most important person. It's not always the most important person that needs to do the speaking. Um, so i just kind of leave you with these, but a press release is the tool, and many of you have done this kind of training and induction before, last year for Heritage Week or whatever, and there's always a kit available from the Heritage Council. Uh, and we talk about the press release. It's the old-fashioned sort of model of delivering information to media. And a press release is a two-page document, usually, that gives all the details of your event, why you're doing it, what's interesting about it this year, and other things that might be of interest to a newspaper or whatever. So on your press release, um, we have created a sort of template that I think has been distributed out to you. Um, so a couple of tips on a press release. It's sort of not written 
the same way as you'd write a kind of prose article, you know, when it's rainy day outside, you know, you can smell the damp, the sky is gloomy, clouds are near. It's not that kind of writing style. It's really punchy. This is happening. It's happening at this time. It's free of charge. It's targeted at families. That's the kind of information that's needed. We don't need the kind of fluffy and flowery stuff. So leave that for you know, your essay or your creative writing at home. So press release is everything but creative writing. So I studied journalism. And the reason why I studied journalism was because I loved creative writing. And in fact, it just blew everything up in terms of my expectations. Uh, it stopped me writing like a creative writer and I had to write like a journalist, which is very mechanical. So there's a, a sort of press release format. You have it there and um, you need to have a headline. And people think, oh, you know, this gives me time to kind of act like a sub editor in the sun or something to come up with a really witty headline. No, not for a press release. You have to state the facts. You know, it's like the subject line, what's in this email? So, you know, Carlo Gardens launch Heritage Week, whatever it is, that's what it is. It's nothing, nothing spectacular. Sorry, I just have to reinforce what you're saying there because, you know, as a um, you know, with a family, it's very frustrating when you do have this beautiful description of an event and you have no information. And it's really common in a newspaper to find, because it's in a place, you know, you're told about an event, you're given a name, you're given a county, you have no idea where it is or the exact time or the basic stuff. You know, so it's very common, it's more common than you think that. So the basic stuff yeah. goes in the first two paragraphs. Yeah. So if you're um, sending your stuff into the media, the sign of a good press release is if you crossed all of the bottom paragraphs out, the first two paragraphs would still stand. So that's the test. It's the litmus test for a good press release. So you have that um, template press release, and it'll be kind of interesting if you use that, follow it, adapt it to your own kind of requirements. But um, it'll be interesting to see when you send that out how much of it gets picked up. And I can almost guarantee, I'd almost put money on it, that it'll be what you put in the first two paragraphs. And I'd still encourage you to write a press release, even if local media isn't a big target because when you have a two-page document you know you say to whoever is doing your uh, social media accounts use the information from that don't go inventing new information so it becomes your sort of oracle as i describe it it becomes the message document this is what we're saying don't say don't start introducing new themes new events anything this is the main thing we want to publicize here and the more people hear the same message across the different formats the more they understand it and the more it penetrates. So you only need a two-page document that everybody's bought into and happy with. So your press release has a bit more purpose than just sending it out to the media. It's your, like we use a lot in our sort of world, you know, it's your key message document. It's sort of, you know, it's just... Executive summary. Precisely, whatever you want to say about it, but exactly, that's what it is. And everybody buys into it, you know. Well, I wonder how it is it, because sometimes, yes, there's a key message, executive summary, fully accessible, and all of that. But everybody has a different interest, too. You know, that I would end up sometimes writing for academics, parents, children, press, and they're all different, actually. It's not, I can never really lose one press release. Yeah, well, fair enough, but I suppose for Heritage Week, you know, it's... A slightly, you know, it's a week you want public participation. Yeah, I think your story to me is what you said about audience mm. is really key. Sure. Because yeah. you will write, if you're trying to attract families, you might write slightly different if you're trying to attract another audience. Yeah. 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 Sure, I mean, but the, the basic information needs to be consistent, you know, um, and that's kind of my net point that, you know, obviously if you're writing for an academic, you know, um, volume or whatever, or, you know, uh, an academic paper, it will be much different. But I think we're really just talking about getting the message about Heritage Week, the events or whatever, out into the media. So that's all I suppose we can fit into this short session. But I do appreciate, absolutely, an opinion editorial is different, but we're not going to go through that today. Um, is that, sorry. <laughs> no, I think it is just more because it's very easy to say, here's the template, mm. and you have your factual what went well on today. Mm. But it's that little bit you were talking about, your angle. Mm. That is what will attract a very different, because some people go, oh yeah, families, that's great, I'm going to go with that. But it's actually, that could put someone else off. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's, it's just really to 
say, yes, the templates create an key side of facts. But if you're angry mm -hmm. it, you may need to tweak it. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, I appreciate that. Absolutely. It goes without saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Thanks for that interview. Is it advisable or not to include a picture or a photograph in a press mm -hmm. release? I'm thinking of the old, <coughs> old adage, a picture tells a thousand story. Yes. <laughs> I think if your picture is good. What I might just flick onto are the pictures, if that's... Yep. The vision before the event should be sent out to Okay. Usually before an event, you send out what we call a press notice, which is an abridged version of a press release just telling details about where, when and why. But I think for Heritage Week, if you just invest in a press release and maybe send it out before your event, and then it gives all the details that you might need, and then maybe afterwards you can send out photos or whatever to your local media. So just not to overcomplicate it. I suppose I was just trying to keep things kind of tight today because it is just for Heritage Week. But if you were doing a media strategy, so for example, like today, colleagues of mine worked on a um, social housing launch out in Dolphins Barn. People will be familiar with it. And there's just a launch of uh, some of the refurbished um, apartments and, and flats there. So about two days ago, we would have sent out what's called a press notice, alerting the media to the fact that the minister is coming. He's going to be opening... Um, reopening uh, accommodation at Dolphins Barn today and he arrived at 11 o'clock and we put out a press release sort of to coincide with his arrival so a lot of the reporters or whatever in the media maybe tomorrow is the fact that he did that launch you know so it's sort of different that the tactics but I think just in terms of like there's a lot of people in this room that are volunteers and you know you don't have a huge amount of time so I would say one good document for the press to let them know you know, what's happening, and if you have an image to go with it, great. So sometimes, you know, if you're sending in a press release in advance of your event, I'm suggesting maybe you could set up a picture of getting ready for your event, you know, so that the next week then people will read the piece in the paper and they'll come along to the event. Um, so there's a couple of tips there about when to send them out, send by email, whatever, so you can just kind of follow those tips as you go along and there'll be more on the... Um, on the website and then just quickly on photos if you want the media to come to take a photo and you will know yourself like most local newspapers they don't have full-time photographers anymore so they're going to use a local photographer who supplies to all the regional newspapers and sometimes you're going to have to pay for that service for him or her to come and cover your media event so if you can get somebody that knows how to take good photography um, then I think enlist them or whatever, but particularly local media don't have the resources to be sending photographers out. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, if you're inviting media, particularly national media or whatever, you send in a photo notice and you explain how the photo is going to look, what they can expect to capture and when to come. Um, so that's a, a photo notice. I have an example of a photo notice just in this um, presentation, which I won't go through, but you, you have that as a template. Um, action shots are better than formal shots. So, you know, a lot of uh, provincial newspapers you see kind of backs up against the wall. You know, the big line of people, 20 people. And the only people that look at them is yourself, to find yourself in them, you know, or somebody else, you know. And they're the most boring shots and they're not memorable at all. The ones that are memorable are the ones where you have, like, you know, a child and a dog jumping out of a field full of daisies or daffodils or whatever it is, you know, like really bright, alive shots. Um, getting a celebrity along. So if you have a celebrity in your area for Heritage Week, get them into the photo. Um, a minister, you know, maybe so, I don't know, whatever you think, um, depending on how much they're photographed. Um, and children make for great photos. But the only thing is, like, children are kind of hard to manage. Like, you know, particularly you have this cutesy little two-year-old, you know, and then <coughs> he or she will start crying and they're out of the photo and it's a disaster. So I kind of think if you're planning to include children, I get, like, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-olds where they're still relatively cute, you know, a few missing teeth and things like that, you know, and they're a bit more disciplined and they'll cooperate a little bit better and they're kind of excited and, and whatever. The other thing to do is make sure if you're using children, under 18, you need permission from the parents, so you need sign consent from the parents uh, to use them in the photo. Um, so never send in a photo unless it's good quality. If you start sending in photos every week of kind of, you know, 
backs up against the wall, eventually you're going to be banned from the um, email list, you know, because the thing with the busy journalist kind of now, you know, they're also filtering through tons of emails and they don't want big stuff in their email that's kind of taken ages to download or whatever, they'll just delete it. So make sure your photo is brilliant. Um, so that's just an example of a, a photo notice uh, that you can have a look at. These are just photos that sort of made it. Uh, so this was the, um, the launch of uh, the European Year of Cultural Heritage, which was held back in January. And these photos and this photo um, managed to land on some of the front pages of national media, so that was kind of worth it. Obviously, the special celebrity guest there is the minister. She's a bit over-photographed now, but this was in her sort of early days, so everybody's kind of keen to get the photo. And then you have compliant teenagers who are very good, um, and then you have objects, you have artefacts, so introducing a prop. So if you have, you know, things to hold, I was just, the next photo actually, you know, yeah, it's, this is um, an event we work on Africa Day and uh, that's held up in uh, Farmley <laughs> Estate every year and it's so colourful, you know, we used a, a car park wall, graffiti on the wall, the globe, the globe is such a kind of prolific prop, I was looking, there was four photographs this week with the globe in it in uh, the national media, just for global awards, this, that and the other, you know, so just think of things that, objects that kind of resonate with whatever it is that you're publicising, um, so we were this is about the world and it's about music and fun and everything, so your picture tells, as you say, a thousand stories. Just, just a quick suggestion on that with the photographs. Um, 2014 wasn't for Heritage Week, was another event I organised. I actually went into the school with the permission of the principal and launched it in the school. Um, the kids there, of course, had all the gear on for what I was doing and the photograph appeared and the amount of parents that turned up that day and said I was right here. Mm -hmm. So it was the way that the kids <laughs> we want to go to it. Yeah, and it, it, it worked out really, really well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, it's great. Obviously, Heritage Week isn't happening when the schools are open. And that's a bit of a, a drag in some ways. Like, it's great, and, you know, it's when people are off, but you just don't have the vehicle to kind of feed into. Um, and then, you know, the local radio. So you said you do local radio first. And I think, you know, as I said at the start, local radio is so important, particularly outside of Dublin. You know, it becomes the most listened to, you know, whether it's LMFM or, you know, Midlands or wherever you're from, KCR, uh, you know, like we all kind of listen to local radio. Um, so we changed the dial for the death notices and we stick it at the, the local radio then for the rest of the day. And again, that's kind of a different audience because, you know, you may not have, you know, say parents who are out at work listen to local radio, but this is, um, so Brian, I think you mentioned, or somebody actually had fed back about the grandparents rocking up with the children. The grandparents will be listening to the local radio, and that's where you're sort of changing your message and sort of making it appropriate for, um, for uh, different ears or whatever. Just, uh, sorry, it's an observation, it's nothing to do with this at all, but I kind of, you know, think people say, oh, it's kind of for children or whatever, but one thing about sort of museums and cultural experiences, I think, you know, in many ways, you shouldn't look at them having any kind of barriers for whatever age group, um, because sometimes, you know, if there's stuff that's useful and interesting for children, you know, you have parents and grandparents looking at something through the lens of a child, and they see things a lot differently, you know? It's actually a different way of experiencing culture and exhibitions, and the same way for a child, with their grandparents, you know, I, I think the best kind of um, formula for culturally curious and most engaged is somewhere, a kid somewhere between say eight and 12, because apparently after 12, they get a bit more resistant. They don't really sort of like being told information and they're not absorbing it, they're not as curious. But so that culturally curious age group between eight and 12 matched with somebody who is retired out, has, you know, spending time reflecting and whatever. It's a magical relationship, you know, the, the culturally curious and the, the um, older person offering the information to, to the younger person. I think there's a brilliant marriage there. So I think that kind of package of something for the grandparents, there's something in it, you know, for sure. Um, so anyway, just a little observation. <laughs> I'm kind of passionate about that at the moment. I just kind of have seen it working. And, you know, we do a bit of work with St. Patrick's Cathedral 
uh, up the road and that's kind of their experience like it's great to talk to the people that really aren't interested or the teenagers the parents rushing around or whatever but you get a marriage made in heaven when you get a couple of youngsters and and their grandparents into the uh, cathedral so broadcast media i'm going to finish off on oh i'm running late so excuse me but um I'll be very quick on broadcast media. Just, I suppose, one or two tips on broadcast media. Before you do your interview, find out, is it possible to go into the studio? Sounds much better. And avoid, particularly, I suppose, you know, depending on where you live, but you know, if your signal isn't brilliant, then you should be doing the interview on a landline if you have to do by phone. So they're just kind of things to check out. Um, there's just kind of, you know, different things that you may not have to worry about, uh, but they're just kind of tips. Um, I like the tip of don't eat chocolate, drink milk or whatever before going on air. It produces a lot of kind of heavy saliva and you sort of, <laughs> when you get nervous or whatever and you're pumping saliva and then you can hardly find your tongue. So just, you know, I think it's an interesting um, little tip. And then you have, um, you have the kind of top nine mistakes is about using too many messages, about using insider language, like you know, what is heritage, you know, break it down. So what is, you know, your, your local event or whatever, make it tangible, make it real for people. Uh, don't over prepare it, don't squeeze in too many messages, three messages. If you can deliver three points, what it is, where it is, who can come. That's the perfect interview. And don't be afraid to say it two or three times because when people are listening to the radio, they're not sitting down listening to the radio, they're making sandwiches, they're talking to somebody else, they're looking at their phone, so you need to say it a few times for the message to land. And uh, that takes us neatly to the end. So. <laughs>